It's this video of me playing a board game. Uh, this is going to be another game that's uh, that's going to be slightly outside of the small box big game series, actually. This is going to be kind of a, a medium box um, big game, um, but we're not going to make a special series for it. This is going to be just a separate YouTube video of me talking about a board game that I adore and enjoy and uh, would recommend everybody pick up and play if you can. Uh, this game that we're going to be talking about today is going to be Imperium the Contention, um, and this is essentially a 4X game that was designed by a designer who was setting to build a 4X game, but with Magic the Gathering style uh, mechanics according to the developer themselves. So that, that's their wording, that's how they called it. Um, but essentially what you end up having is, uh, this game is not, as far as I understand, is not related to Imperium, uh, sorry, Twilight Imperium at all. Uh, but it is still a 4X game, and I think it does a fantastic job of achieving its goal uh, of getting a 4X game in a very relatively short period. Uh, it says back here it's a 30 to 120 minutes as far as the playtime. So, you know, take take that with your with a grain of salt. Um, I think it lasts about an hour if you're playing with uh, two players and you're playing by the actual rules. Um, but we'll talk about that later. So, first thing I want to do is I want to go ahead and show before I open the box is I want to show what the insert looks like normally. So I've sleeved all my cards and I've um, um, added some deck boxes and stuff inside. So I'll show that later. But this is what it looks like in general if you have the board game normally. Um, all the cards will fit. So all of these cards here, which are in sleeves, these are the actual player decks. So these are pre-made decks, I mean. Um, so this, all these red cards will normally fit inside of this small red box uh, that's here. And then you have space for like uh, the bigger cards, which sit right here, which they fit perfectly fine. They have uh, extra components like the counters and other stuff. And then you have the money and the little uh, first player, first player thing. Um, but the reason I wanted to show this is because once you sleeve all the cards and uh, there's normally, a, there's normally, I think 170, or 180 cards that are here that are for solo playthrough. Um, and also for uh, if you want to play like a drafting style and those fit here normally. Uh, but of course, once you sleeve everything, which I've done, um, there's literally no room inside this insert. So that's one of the sad things about this. Uh, the insert is, you know, re kind, kind of well thought out, um, except for it doesn't accommodate fitting sleeved cards. So I just wanted to show this just to show you guys that when you do sleeve your cards, it does take up quite a bit of space. This is basically 90, uh, 93 cards here, this section here, uh, where normally it'll fit, I think, about maybe 100, I think I want to say 200, 200-ish 200 cards sleeved. And this will normally fit the um, 180 cards that come from the pre-made decks. So this is about 180 cards worth of space here. And this is about uh, 90, sorry, uh, yeah, 90 cards sleeved. So as you can see, it's a huge, huge difference as far as how much space they take up. So I just wanted to show that just ahead of time. If you're looking to sleeve the game um, like I have, then uh, <laughs> you're going to have some space issues. So the solution that I ended up having for this game um, is I use deck boxes and different colored sleeves so let me open this up here's the uh, solo rule book if you want to play the game solo and then here is the full rule book if you're going to just play through the normal game uh, you need both if you're going to play solo so you can know the base rules put this out the way so these are the deck boxes i have uh these are essentially just uh two 180 card decks and i i, I guess i'm using game genic um, i don't really have any true recommendations they just fit in the box pretty well um, so these are all the cards that you will play with if you are drafting, and these are all the cards that you will play with if you're playing solo. Um, and then this between these two is all the uh, pre-made decks and the uh, little deck boxes that will normally fit in here. So let me just get this out of here. And uh, it fits pretty nicely. So essentially, you know, when both of these are in, uh, I can fit the rest of the components right on top of it, and it fits perfectly fine. So that's the storage solution I have. Uh, if they do come out with expansions and extensions to the game. <laughs> Then I guess we'll have issues with storage, but we'll deal with that in the future. <coughs> um, this deck box would normally hold all of this stuff, which are these guys. So we'll hold them up. Oh, it's upside down. So it would normally hold them all through here, like so. And then I would also store the ships and other stuff, like so. Right, there we go. Put it back in its place. And the other one uh, would store the rest of the cards. As you can see, these are the other three factions, or other three pre-made decks, I should say. Um, and then this little slot here will hold these cards. So I'm just kind of putting everything back together just to show you uh, that you can sleeve everything and put it on the box. Um, I know I haven't started with a review of the game yet, but let me um, let me get this together, and then we'll start because uh, 
one of the cool things about the storage solution that I have here is that this actually helps out with setting up a solo game pretty easily. So okay, so we have our two deck boxes. I can label these later. Um, in here you have the uh, tuck boxes that normally come with the game and the little pieces, and then of course you have the um, 180 cards that are for sorry 186 cards that are for the pre-made decks that are in here, um, and they're color coded. Uh, it took a little bit to get the sleeves, but you know I got them through. Uh, they're color coded based on the faction to kind of match up, make it easier to recognize and notice. And then another thing that comes with this game that retails for $60, if I'm not mistaken, um, is you get a whole bunch of solo cards. Sorry, not solo, uh, drafting cards, which these are essentially these cards for the pre made factions, with the exception of these cards are kind of generalized. So they have some faction symbols, but you, you theoretically could essentially build every single faction deck that I have here. Uh, with these cards and that's one of the cool things about this game is because when you play a little bit more advanced at a more advanced level you can actually do like a drafting um, a drafting uh, alternative to where you draft your cards and you set your you know get your cards and get your deck build up and have your ship ready and then you can build it up and have fun that way so this is the drafting cards I'm only going to show these guys temporarily but just to show you that there's a lot of content in this box in these boxes um, and you know that alone in my opinion makes the game really really awesome so let me put all this away and let's move on to the rest of the review and then we'll start playing or so we'll go through the review we'll go through the rules and then we'll start playing solo so we can see how I do in this campaign so that's there we go all done all the way and move this out of the way we don't need those all right last one at least all right these are the solo cards um, so I put them in a white deck box with white cards to show the solo, and then these are the rewards you can earn. Uh, we'll be needing these here soon, so I'll put these to the side. Alright, so this game is essentially a, like I said, a 4x game. Your goal is to destroy your opponents. So I'm going to pick my Zerg, which they're essentially Zerg, but they're not Zerg. They're, uh, they go by a different name. But I'm going to pick the faction that reminds me the most of Zerg, I should say. And each faction has a uh, different theme. So for my fa for the faction that's here, the red faction, uh, these guys are kind of like the bug-like people. Uh, and their whole deal is that they are pretty cheap and they expand pretty fast. Um, but they, they kind of have to balance, you know, expanding with uh, expanding and holding on to their ground with some relatively weak slash cheap units. But all the factions have, like I said, a, a kind of kind of nice balance to them for the pre-made decks so I'll compare these guys to the green guys which remind me the most of the Protoss if you play Starcraft and as you can see these cards have a lot of information on them so I'm gonna bring a few of these up for a little bit of closer view so let's go ahead and start with this card uh, this card and these two so the cards themselves have this information that you can see here. Oh, that you can. Oh, that one's green. That's why. Yeah, this one's green and shiny. <laughs> it's gonna be pretty easy to see. Um, but it has some really cool artwork on on the cards themselves. Um, but the card information. So this card shows the price of the card. So it costs you two. Uh, should be able to see that if I lean it up. There we go. So it costs two dollars for you to actually play this card. And this is the name of the card. This is the type of the card. For instance, this card is a bio ship. Um, and down here you have the damage that it can do, the defense. So that's how much damage the shield is, how much hit points it takes, or how much hit points it has. So you have to do that in a single round. And last one, at least, is how fast it moves. And then here you have some special text where if the card itself did anything uh, spectacular, it would be um, listed there. And this other card is an action card. As you can see, it's called an action card. It's the Ion Storm. So this is basically a, a storm <laughs> from the Protoss. Uh, it costs $3 for you to play it. And then it tells you the effect of what it does. You deal two damage to all ships in a square grid, uh, two by two, and you do two damage to each spot. And uh, that includes buildings and everything else. Uh, moving on to the next two. Um, for this card, which is gonna be even harder to see because it's all green, uh, wow, that's <laughs> almost impossible to see. Um, it costs five dollars. It's a ship. It's a battle cruiser, uh, a sec battle cruiser, as you can see here. And its stats, it has a four, or sorry, it does four damage, takes four damage to kill, and it moves four. And then there's also a um, some special text down here, where it says uh, this ship ignores effects that prevent it from moving. So, 
pretty nice ship to have and a uh, pretty different type of card to have. And this last card that we'll talk about before I actually explain how the game works in general is the Broodmother. Uh, this one costs $3 for you to play. It's an agent. And some cards in this game have the effect called attach. Attach means that you basically attach it to that particular thing. In this case, you attach this to a friendly colony, which we'll talk about soon. And it turns that colony into a shipyard, which the keyword shipyard means that you can deploy ships from that particular card. And uh, at the beginning of a turn, you get to spawn a 1-1-1 drone. So one attack, one defense, one movement droneling into play here. So it's a nice way for you to get some nice cheap but weak units for the um, uh, for the red faction, which let me see if I can get their name. Here they are. They're the, the Runin. And the other one we're talking about was the uh, Sek. So, and it has some nice artwork on here. Uh, let me bring up the Terran and the Runin so you can actually see them on the overhead here. So there's like the nice little artwork. And the artwork in this game is actually really good. Um, I like it quite a bit. Um, I'm, a, I'm a huge fan of, uh, I guess, I don't know what we call it nowadays, but <laughs> back in the days when I first started playing board games 10 years ago, um, Ameritrash, uh, where basically it's a huge, huge emphasis on theme. This game is bleeding with theme as far as how the factions are presented, how the cards are presented, and how they play. So more kudos to the game. Um, I'm still shocked that this game is not related to Twilight Imperium at all. I played Twilight Imperium all of one time in my entire lifetime, and uh, yeah, that, that game was pretty thematic and this game feels like a what well, somebody called on the on the forums the greatest hits of a 4x game like twilight imperium so take that with a grain of salt take that with a grain of salt all right so let's go ahead and get into how you actually play the game because that part is more important <laughs> for some people for most people so when you have your decks um, everybody will have their 30 cards 30 plus 1, so 31 cards. And uh, when you run out of cards, uh, the rulebook tells you this, but it took me a while to figure this out for some reason. Uh, when you run out of cards, you actually just shuffle, uh, reshuffle your deck of any card that's not exhausted. And these are the home worlds. Let me find the two that are relevant. So the Runin and the Sek right here. And every base, or sorry, every card has their, or sorry, every person has their own home world. So let me set up a board and then we'll talk about the individual cards. Yes, there we go. And then we set up our actual play area, which are these nice size cards. These are nice size cardboard. Um, I'm getting sleeves for them because I, I do want to cover them uh, for these bigger cards. And the designer has posted on the forums the actual exact size you need, which is really nice because I love it when the designer is uh, interactive and they actually pre present information like that. So, this game is so simple that <laughs> I really don't have to explain most of the rules for us to actually jump in. Um, so that's why I kind of spent a lot of time talking about the rest of the things that I want to make sure to hit on. But going into the actual playthrough, this is a setup for a two-player game. The rulebook has set up, the rulebook has a setup for higher player counts, lower player counts, or yeah, higher player counts. But two players is the lowest player count that you can set it up for. And oh, this is cricket. That's a little bit better. And uh, everybody has one of these cards, which is called your bluff card. So both factions have a bluff card, which let me see if I can find the greens. Uh -huh. Ah, there it is. And the bluff card is basically one of the things that um, I like in this game too, because it gives you this nice little mechanic of kind of you know fanning, fanning a turn or doing a thing that you maybe don't want your opponent to know that you're doing. So let's go ahead and tilt this one up so we can actually read it. So the bluff card itself at the bottom it tells you the actual play round. So you play, um, you play as many rounds until somebody wins, and I'll talk about the win conditions later. Um, actually, no, let me talk about the win conditions now. The goal of the game is to essentially either have eight territories controlled by the end of your turn so at the end of the round if you have eight territories that are controlled and your opponent has not reduced that number at all then you the person who has eight will win um, and vice versa if your opponent does the same and in a two-player game in a two-player game the first person to destroy their opponent's base will win uh, that's another win condition and the last win condition that's persistent through all the playthroughs is the favor counter so everybody will have a counter like this 
that goes up to 12. And in a two-player game, the first person to eight favor will win the game. So if you get eight favor, then you win. And you get favor by doing various things. Uh, one of the most prominent ones is if you destroy an opponent's settlement, if you destroy a place that opponent has a token on, then that opponent loses one favor and you gain two favor. So you gain two victory points. Um, and there's, there's some cards that give you some favor too, but that's pretty much a primary way to win it. If you're playing a higher than two player game, uh, if you if you destroy your opponent's home world or capital, then you get four points and they lose three. And uh, those are the two ways to score favor. And like I said, outside of other cards. And if you notice on the bluff card I mentioned before, right here, it tells you how to actually score the favor. So it's really cool, really nice, really helpful information. Really helpful information. And uh, that's kind of the flow of things. So that's how you win the game. So moving on to how you actually play the game. Uh, when you play the game, you go through phasing. So you go through four different phases. Uh, phase one, which will bring the bluff card back up because it has all the information right there. Uh, phase one is you do the beginning. Everybody gets money and then you draw a card. So to explain money, basically you look at the board state and you count how many planets you control, how many locations you control. So if I'm playing red, I count the places I control, which currently is one and I get that plus one. So I get the number of places I control plus one dollar. So I get two dollars. So I will go ahead and grab myself two space dollars. There we go. So I now have two dollars. My opponent would subsequently get two dollars as well because I have two locations. And then we move on to the next part. And the next part is we do the command. So everybody gets to move their ships if they have any. Um, when you move your ships, this is one of the rules that I got wrong when I played uh, versus my friend earlier. But when you move your ships, you can move them um, as many spaces as they have listed. So let me get this settled. There we go. Chaos everywhere. When you move your ships, you can move them as many spaces that they have listed. So like we looked at before on a card, so on this card as an example, uh, this particular ship can move two. So this particular ship, if it were on the board already, it could move two based on the number down there. And when you move your ships, let's say hypothetically I had it already deployed, you move them uh, orthogonally, there is no diagonal movement. So I can do one, two, or I can do one, two, or I can do one, two, it's up to me. I'm just gonna do here. And then after you have your ship in a location, if you have that ship there, you can peek at the card that's here. So you can take a little look and see if you want to maybe sell, settle that later if it's unexplored or face down. And your opponent gets to do the same thing. And then the next thing you do, according to this card, is you do a hammer action. So the hammer action uh, has two different things it can do. Hammer action number one is you can, by default, settle a planet. So when you settle a planet, that's uh, basically expand. You settle a colony that does not have somebody else's settlement on it. So it has to be blank or it has to be one of the face down ones. So if I'm playing the Runin and I want to settle, let's say I want to do this. So I settle this world. I take my little token, put it right there. Boom, that's in, done all done. I've done my single hammer action that the game allows me to do at this time. My opponent on the other hand, let's say my opponent uh, decided and they hypothetically had this card there too. Let's say my opponent decides to do their hammer action and instead of expanding, let's say my opponent wants to do the hammer action on their abilities. Oh sorry, the hammer action on their um, building. So if you look at the home world a little bit closer for the sec home world, down here on the hammer action it says that they can choose to do a friendly ship sorry a friendly ship may jump up to two sectors and then you draw a card so you can choose to do that if you want to you don't have to but let's say for some reason the sec hypothetically had this card out this uh, 333 ship that has blockade which prevents enemies from producing money at that location and let's say they wanted to jump that one up by two so they want to go fight this drone because they went second this round so they're going to go ahead and activate this action which is to do this hammer action they're going to move one two right there and uh, then they would draw their card like normal so then they would draw a card because that's what the ability says and then moving on to the rest of everything uh, the next thing we do in the command actions after we do our hammer action uh, we go to the face off so the face off is where you play your cards oh sorry I forgot to draw cards earlier um, but the face off is where you play your cards so you look at your hand of cards and then you just basically play for what you or <laughs> play what you can afford um, it's up to you. You don't have to play everything in your hand. Let's move on to the red player. Let's say I'm the Runin. And let's say hypothetically this is my hand. You will always have your bluff card in your hand. 
Uh, once again, you'll always have your bluff card in your hand. So that's one of the things to uh, keep in mind. Um, so what you can choose to do, let's say hypothetically I had the $2 I had on the board and I had this card of this hand of cards in my hand. Um, I can choose to put this bluff face down and what you do is I'll do like this. So I'm putting a bluff face down. This means that for this round, when it's revealed, I'm basically bluffing. I'm basically saying I'm not going to do anything right now. But my opponent, let's say my opponent plays one of their cards that they can afford, which I think these guys are all expensive, but sure. Now nah, that one do that one. Uh, oof. Man, this is rough. Okay, there we go. <laughs> so let's say the sec wants to play this card. So I put it face down like so. And then we both reveal at the same time. Now, if there's more than two players, then everybody does the same thing, of course. But if there's two players, then both of us would reveal. So I reveal a bluff card. My opponent reveals a jump card. Now, the jump card says that a friendly unit jump or friendly a friendly ship jumps up to two sectors and then draw a card. So um, they're going to do that. My bluff card, just a bluff, it means that I'm not playing anything right now. My opponent would pay for the card. And then they would do the action. So they put it into the scrap pile, which is their discard, right over here and they would jump this card, this carrier, let's say they jump at 1-2, like so, and they're going to be attacking my base, so now i got to worry about that. That's actually a big deal for me to worry about. So after that's done, I can choose to leave my bluff face up and pass the next round as well, or I can take it back into my hand. In this case, since I'm now being threatened over there, I'm going to take this card back into my hand, so I put this bluff card back in my hand, and my opponent is also going to um, choose to do a play a card. Uh, let's say... My opponent has hypothetically these cards in, in their hands. These cards are pretty expensive. This is a two dollars. This is for three dollars, and they only have one dollar left. So that means that their only choice is to play a bluff card. All they can do is play a bluff card. So they're going to play a bluff card. Up, oh, sorry. This other card they have is three dollars as well. So they have a three, three, two. They can't afford anything right now. Whoop. So my opponent is going to play a bluff card. I don't know that. Um, for me, I'm going to go ahead and play this card called a drone. The drone costs $1. It is a 1-1-2 one, one, ship, and it has an ability called Sentry. Sentry means that uh, this ship may be played at any of your locations. Now, just to pause really fast, one of the cool things I love about this game is that the designer decided to put some of the explanation text on the cards. Now, it's not on every single card. I wish it was on every single card, uh, but sometimes you don't have space for it. But for this instance, uh, the, car, the, the keyword Sentry, um, I know what it is because the card tells me. And if I look at the rule book, the rule book will also tell me what it does as well. So that's really cool. Um, kudos to the designer for doing that. So I'm going to play this card face down. And then my opponent and I are going to reveal our cards. My opponent reveals a bluff. And I reveal a Sentry, or sorry, I reveal a drone, which I paid my $1 for. And it has Sentry, so I can choose to spawn it at this location that's being threatened. And we'll talk about how combat works later, but that's going to be good for me later. And now we move on to the next part. Um, I have a card that costs $4 and a bluff. My opponent is going to leave their bluff face up because they don't want to do anything else. So I'm going to go ahead and play a bluff. And we have now ended the face-off round. The face-off round ends once everybody plays a bluff. Once again, the face-off round ends once everybody plays a bluff. So if both of us have play, played a bluff in the very first turn, then that would end the face-off round, and that might not be advantageous for either of us, but it just kind of depends on what your strategy is at the time, so you have to be careful about that. All right, so now that we've done that, we're going to move on to the next phase, which is the last one, which is called Battle. Um, assign targets, and then you damage, and then you pass the Void Scepter. So the Void Scepter is the first player token. In this example, we're just using hypotheticals that I was going first as the Runin. Um, this means that I would take my ships that I have here and I would assign damage. This ship has nothing it could damage. It does not have any range and there's nothing to actually attack right now. Uh, this ship can attack that one. It's not going to kill it, but it can attack it. It's not going to do anything. The damage will be healed later on, which we'll talk about in a moment. But this ship um, has three damage. It can choose. It can only choose to attack defenders. So right now I have a defender, which is the drone. So that means that this ship has to attack this one. Uh, the cruiser cannot attack the base that it's at, and it cannot destroy the base that it's at right now because there's a defender. So that's why I wanted to play this card earlier. So my opponent is going to, of course, target my drone to attack. And then uh, after, all, all, after all targets have been assigned uh, their damage, then we do all the damage at the same time. So my drone is going to shoot the cruiser at the same time that the cruiser is going to shoot the drone. The drone is going to die. This goes to my discard. 
The sentry is going to do nothing. The cruiser technically has one damage on it, so it has it takes two more damage to kill it. And that's pretty much it. Nothing else is firing. Nothing else is shooting. So now at the end of this round, at the end of the battle phase, everything that took damage heals up to max health. So this cruiser is going to go up to max health of three. So the damage doesn't carry over, basically. And the Void Scepter will pass. And we start our next round. And on our next round, first thing we do is we go back to our bluff card, which I have right here. And we get our money. So as the Runin, I have two worlds. Even though there's an enemy ship here, I have two worlds. Uh, oh, let me take it back. <laughs> My opponent has a cruiser. And the cruiser has blockade, which means that I don't get any resources from this planet. So sadly, I only get $2 instead of 3 But normally I would get 3 because I have 1, 2 locations plus $1. But because of blockade, I get $2 and that's it. So one for my home base, plus one. So I'll take my $2 and be sad. My opponent only has one world, so they will get $2 as well. And then we move on to the next phase, which is draw a card. So I'm going to draw my card, put it right here. My opponent's going to draw their card, put it right there. And the next thing you do is you do command move ships. So I'm going to move my ship, or sorry, my opponent's going to move their ship first because they're the first player. My opponent is satisfied with where they're at. They want to try to force me to lose this place, and they like the fact that I'm losing dollars, so they're going to keep it there. So they're going to basically pass on moving their ships. And now I'm going to move my ship. I'm going to go one, two, because I want to defend this location again. I don't want to lose it. And I have a plan for this turn, too. Okay, so now this is done. Um, now we're going to do our hammer action starting with my opponent. My opponent is going to choose to expand this time around because they want to make sure they have money for next time. So they're going to take one of their tokens, put it right there. Whoop. And now that they've done that, um, that's pretty much it. I have the option to do my hammer action. Um, with my hammer action, I am going to choose to do... Well, I have a choice of doing this action, which is the target opponent loses one favor. Which, is, which could be okay, but my opponent has no favor right now, so it doesn't matter. Or I can choose to do, do this hammer action, where I get to put a 1-1-1 drone on top of this card as a ship. And then I get to draw a card. And that doesn't seem too good right now. I can just expand. So I will just expand, which I will go ahead and do that, my free hammer action. And I got this little nice little colony over here. So next time around, I'll get my $3. Or if I'm able to kill this, I'll get my $4, and that'll be great. So now we move on to the next step in the round, which is the command. Oh, sorry, which is the uh, face-off. So now we start playing our cards. So I have my hand of cards here, and my opponent has her hand of cards there. And then we go through and we play our cards. Um, let's say my opponent is going to. My opponent really wants to kill this base, so they have to get rid of this drone. So they have a card called Ion Storm we talked about earlier, which will do two damage to everything in a square. Um, or or they can do a force jump instead. So force jump, the text is the text is kind of ambiguous. Um, I think there needs to be clarity on this card in particular. But the text on this card says deal two damage to a ship. It doesn't say whose ship. It says a ship. Uh, and then it says you may jump it up to three sectors. So what my opponent is going to do in a very clever, clever play on words, is my opponent is going to play force jump face down. And for me, in a very clever play of words, um, I'm going to play protect the hive because this card will give a friendly location. 2 damage plus 2 shield um, for this round. So I'm going to play that face down. So now we do our face off. We reveal at the same time. Technically my opponent resolves first. So my opponent plays their force jump. Uh, they get to deal 2 damage to a ship and they may move it up to 3 sectors. So they're going to choose to use force jump on this drone which dealing 2 damage to this ship kills it. So the drone actually dies. And they played their card. Now I'm going to go ahead and do my card. I'm going to play protect the hive which cost me, oh sorry, my opponent I had to spend two dollars for that sorry now i'm going to play protect the hive which is going to cost me one dollar and i will put it here so my plan was originally to use the damage between the damage of my drone and protect the hive i would have been able to kill this cruiser but sadly because my opponent killed my drone i don't get to do that and then you just kind of be sad about it so then we move on to the next phase uh, which is the next face off i have nothing i can actually play my opponent can't afford any of their cards so we're both going to play our bluffs, which, sorry, this is accidentally face up last time. So I play my bluff face down. My opponent plays their bluff. We reveal, we both bluff. The round is over. So now we go over to damage. This cruiser will deal three damage to this base, which means this base has one damage left before it dies. And then this base will attack this cruiser for two. 
Uh, this cruiser has three health, so it will have one health before it dies, so nothing happens essentially. Then we move on. We'll play one more test round and then we'll go into the actual solo setup. So that card goes away at the end of the round. We start the next round, this passes, everything heals back up, and then we do it all again. So at the beginning, I'm going to go ahead and get money, starting with me, I'm going to get one, two. Can I get money from here because of blockade? This has been a very pesky and annoying card so far, so I'm going to get $3. And my opponent is going to get one, two, three, so they're going to get $3. And um, we're going to go ahead and draw a card. So I'm going to draw my card. And my opponent is going to draw their card, which they get this one. And then we move on to the next one, which is command, move ships. I have no ships to move as the Runin, but my opponent has a ship to move. My opponent is pretty satisfied with what's happening here. They're going to they're continue to be a nuisance over here. So now it's going to move over back to me. Um, with my move ships, um, like I said, I don't have any ships to move. Now I get to do my hammer action. For this hammer action, I'm going to go ahead and continue to expand because my opponent can't stop me from expanding. So I will continue to expand. And I get this new planet here, which is nice. This one has a hammer action of get a dollar. That could be useful later. My opponent gets their hammer action as well. So my opponent will decide to expand too. And they, re they revealed a crimson gate, which does a thing. Uh, and now we move on to the next round and we just kind of keep going back and forth back and forth until the game's over um, The key rules to talk about Before we actually move on to playing a solo playthrough is that ships can move through each other uh, That's one of the rules that like I said I played wrong earlier when I played with played against my friend um, You cannot you cannot discover planets or sorry settle planets that have enemy ships on it. So hypothetically uh Yeah, let's do it like this. Perfect. So hypothetically, if it, was, if it was my turn for a hammer action, and I wanted to, to use my hammer action to settle a planet, I have no planets I can settle, because this one has an enemy ship on it. This one has it. Well, I could settle this, actually. Um, let's move them back. Sorry, I could not settle any planets in this particular state, because this one has an enemy ship on it, this one has an enemy ship on it, this one has an enemy ship on it. So sadly, there's nothing I can settle. Um, if it were a situation like this, which we were just talking about. Um, I could actually settle the planets, so I could actually settle this planet because it's adjacent. So when you settle, it has to be a orthogonally adjacent to stuff you already own. So I could settle this one and put it like so and, you know, get my money anyway. Um, another rule to mention is that when a planet dies, so let's say my opponent was finally able to kill this planet, so they kill this planet, I lose this settlement. Um, my opponent will get two favor. So they go from 0 to 2, and then I will go from 0 to, I will lose 1. I cannot go below 0, so nothing happens, because I had no favor to begin with. And later on, when it goes to a settle action, let's say my opponent moved this card here, and they move this one over here, and they move this one here, because they're trying to do an all-on assault on all my cards. During the next phase, during the start of the next phase, when it comes to my hammer action, I could actually settle this again. Because once again, it's adjacent, it's not controlled by anybody, and there's no enemy ships on it. But, you know, I'm still probably in trouble with all this going on. So, that's pretty much how the game goes. That's pretty much what we're looking at. Um, it is a very simple, straightforward game. Um, I love the simplicity of the rules, yet the complexity of the cards and what you can do. And it gives you that really, really crunchy 4x feel um, without taking up too much time and too much space. As you can see, it's a relatively small footprint. I say relatively small because once you play a lot of cards, it gets a little busy sometimes. Um, but for the most part, it's self-contained. It keeps uh, it keeps to itself. It keeps to itself. So yeah, so that's pretty much it. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and cut the video here, and then I'm going to upload a second video that I'm actually going to do the solo campaign playthrough, the solo um, um I guess the non-story uh, playthrough. So I don't spoil anything for anybody who wants to play it themselves. Um, but yeah, that's it. So hope you guys enjoyed it, and as always, I will see you guys whenever.